Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin Lee Media Podcast. Before we get into the main show, I have to tell you how you can support my work. The way I found my work, whether it be a review of a movie I rented or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like Mbula Bula, Brian Scuttle, David Walters, Joseph Davis of Sip Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, Tom Blackburn, and more. Help make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all of my lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you can get some pretty sweet perks. Whether you're into 40-hour early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between, consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, if you're not ready to subscribe, you can get a seven-day free trial on every tier I offer. With that said, let's get to the show. Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Now, before you ask, no, this is not a repeat upload. Uh, once I learned that uh, Barbie was going to be coming out on you know, Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray, DVD, and all the other accoutrements, uh, on October 17th, I reinvited Elise Schiffens. Uh, sh- I always get that your last name wrong. Schiffens, right? Chaffins, yep. Okay. Um, so I just knew I had to invite you back on the podcast to talk about all the spoilerific things we couldn't get into on our main podcast episode. So with that said, hi, Barbie. Welcome to the podcast. Tell everyone about what you've been working on since the last time you were on. Oh, a lot of the same. <laughs> my, I finished the manuscript for my Ted Lasso book, so that is out with some first readers to kind of get feedback on. So continuing with that. And then, yeah, just like enveloping myself in all of the terrible horror movies of 2023. (laughs) Since we're coming here in the middle of spooky season and horror is one of my favorites. So that's pretty much it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I saw your I saw your review of what was it? Totally Killer. Is that the new Prime video? Yeah, Yeah, which... I will say it's probably one for people who are older like me. So (laughs) as somebody who was in high school in the late eighties. Yeah. (laughs) As opposed to people who might not have been born in the late (laughs) eighties. Okay. So because (laughs) isn't, isn't it because I thought I read somewhere, maybe it's a different movie um, that either a producer or the writer or the director did he have, have something to do with Happy Death Day or something like that? I think the producers. I think it's okay. a Bloom House. But what I love is that the director also directed Always Be My Maybe, which is one of my That's other it. favorite movies. And I just love that she did a rom-com and now she's doing this like horror movie because those are two of my favorite genres. So I feel very like in it with that. So that was pretty exciting. (laughs) Yeah. I think I got the two conflated. I I was like, I thought, I think that he's directing something else um, this month or something Mm, like that. Christopher Landon, I think his name is, but, but yeah, I need to check that out because I did like always be my maybe. It's the great generator of memes in the past, what, four years since it came out? Something like that, yeah. The Keanu Reeves always being one maybe one of the best one of the best cameos that's up there. <laughs> but with that said, we've got that. You've got the manuscript out to readers. I think you've also published some other things, but follow her Substack. Yeah, it's it's a really good read. She releases more reviews than I do, so Definitely check it out. I think it's MacGuffin or Meaning is the name of it. That's correct. Yeah. But with that said, let's take a trip to Barbie land. Yes, always. <laughs> so speaking of that, let's just get into Barbie land and yeah, let's just get into Barbie land. So mm-hmm. first and foremost, there's this juxtaposition between Barbie land being this idyllic kind of utopian society where there's like President Barbie, Nobel Prize Barbie, stuff like that. And then in the how that contrasts in the real world, especially as we get to Ken. So what do you think of that juxtaposition between the two worlds, so to speak? Well, I feel like 
Barbie land is stunning. It's one of my favorite things I've just seen on screen this year. I think I mentioned it last time that com- and like comparing it to Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. And he has fantastic style, but goodness, I absolutely adored Barbie land. The juxtaposition between the two. I love how they traveled between the two. I thought that was really cool. The real world was interesting. I'm not sure how you make that change work really well. I'm not sure if they totally nailed it, but particularly going to, you know, LA, which is typically seen as kind of a plasticky kind of place also. And I think that might've been part of it, but I don't know. Like, yeah, what do, what do you think? Because that's it's a it's a tough one for me to kind of assess. Mm-hmm. Like if you think about it in that context of, and trust me, we're gonna get to Ken. It it just kind of shows. Okay, here's who Ken could be, if if people adored him and you know things like that. And I think it works in that respect, but not very many others. Right. Yeah. Stylistically, I wish there had been more of a contrast i guess that i think that was probably the hard part for me is that it fe- it feels real compared to barbie land that feels not real but i don't know not i guess i i would have expected something maybe grittier looking or like the lighting to change a little bit more or something yeah. and 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 in terms of that it really kind of doesn't it it's closer than i would have expected i guess yeah, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because, you know, I think if you're going to do it, I think you would say, hey, this this is pink and this is like gray. It's just right. void of all color. Even if you, ooh, something interesting would have been if they shot it in black and white, maybe, or something like that. I don't know. Something that, like or, that. Yeah, or or just have like, and I don't know, I'd have to like, watch it again and pay attention to see if only Barbie wears pink in the real world. I'm not sure. I genuinely am. I can't remember, but I think that could have been something. I don't know. Some kind of way. It just feels like, yeah, there's just not in my mind as much a separation between the two, but, but Barbie land is just a wonder. So. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think to your question about clothing, I think she's the only one who wears bright colored clothing. Mm-hmm. Because I think when we get to Gloria, she's kind of wearing pastel kind of colors. And the, obviously the suits at Mattel are wearing these kind of gray, black kinds of things. Even though I think their whole office at Mattel is like black and so, something like that. Yeah. And then like the inside of the Barbie, what would you call that? The Barbie den, the Barbie boardroom. Right. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, but getting further into, I guess, the juxtaposition between the two. And actually, something I was thinking about was when you were talking about setting it in L.A. Mm-hmm. What if what if they dropped Barbie off in the Midwest? How, how, how different would that movie be? I mean, to me, that would be interesting just because. Yeah, I think. I, yeah, I'm just. I, I I don't know. Like I said, I I just felt like there was kind of a a miss between that. Midwest could have been really interesting to like take it outside of a city entirely. Yeah, I think that could be kind of a a cool way to to show that too. But I mean, if you've got to go to Mattel, which I guess is part of the problem anyway. <laughs> yeah. As we discussed before. So yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know. I think there could be some some different ways to do it. I, I mostly just wish even if they had just used some kind of filter just to give it a little more shadow or something. That's that's really it. It just feels lit almost exactly the same between the two. It's it's definitely not, yeah. but it's it's close enough that I wish there had been just something a little bit more there. So yeah, the uh, sky is the same color. I think. Yeah, uh, it's like okay, now I can't differentiate but the sky of Barbie World and real world, right? Um, even though I think Barbie World is maybe painted on. Is that what it is? 
I think so. Yeah. 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 Just, I don't know the whole thing. Like when they roll out in the rollerblades in that first scene where they're like, Oh, now we're in the real world. It's like the only thing that really, really makes that different to me is, is like the reaction of the people there to her, to Ken. That seems to be the only significant thing. I just, yeah, I wish, I wish stylistically there had been a little bit more separation between the two, but it does. And maybe that was the point is to just show the difference between the two is largely based on attitudes and stuff. Maybe that was the the point of it. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to ask Greta Gerwig. So exactly. if uh, Greta wants to come on and, you know, do we, we can do a third Barbie podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, or uh, Ryan Gosling. I'd be fine with that. You know, yeah, there you go. At, talk to Ryan Gosling for four hours. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but since we're already talking about like, LA and the location of the real world. How did you feel about and, and I think the movie kind of goes out of its way to call this out is the cat calling on Venice Beach. Mm -hmm. Um so how did you feel like that was handled? I thought it was pretty funny. It, it's again, it's one of those things that's been talked about in movies and television shows. It's not like a new kind of thing to call out catcalling or anything i thought they did it funny with regard to barbie and when she's there <laughs> and she mentions you know we don't have genitals so I, I, that's <laughs> kind of funny <laughs> i thought that's the one thing that can make it unique to barbie and they went ahead and used it i didn't hate that i thought that was kind of funny but yeah i mean again like <sighs> the movie just in general it deals with a lot i I appreciated it because it brings a lot of thoughts about sexism, misogyny, and stuff like that, that are talked about in other places and possibly better in other places or with more nuance or whatever. But it brings it in this like very mainstream kind of way, in a way that lots of people are going to see it. And so I appreciated that in a way that maybe other movies that deal with it in a more nuanced or, you know, more gentle way aren't going to be seen. Barbie was seen by a lot of people. So even if it is a feminism 101 kind of thing, that's okay. That's a lot of people who got a little injection there. That to me isn't the worst thing. So yeah. Yeah. A few mil million, you know, yeah. and a few billion at the box office. But yeah, I think it is interesting that that kind of mainstream element of it. I, I think when I was watching the film, the film was that it was kind of saying the quiet part out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's a joke midway into Ken's journey, or I think maybe at the beginning, kind of like when they first go into the real world and Ken guys kind of goes off and does his own thing where some there's like a joke about like, Oh, it, it it doesn't work like that anymore. At least not any or something like that. I forget the actual line, but it, there's something like that. I'll have to look it up and uh, maybe post the clip somewhere. But mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting because it, it it was very much trying to say, "Hey, we try that. This is current society that's trying to reform the I, not patriot. Would it be?" patriarchal ways but also very still stuck in its ways yeah i loved that was definitely a, one of my favorite things when <laughs> ken goes up to the to the exec and he's like you're not doing patriarchy very well <laughs> like that's it oh oh we are doing patriarchy well we just hide it better now and i thought that was probably one of my favorite in a, a movie that out loud says patriarchy a lot <laughs> like in a way that I don't think I've ever heard it said just overtly like that in any movie that I thought that was a really like cheeky little way to deal with that <laughs> yeah it was, it, it was a nice way of saying hey if you don't get it by now here's the message yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah it was it was not subtle <laughs> 
but it's Barbie. And to me, I don't know that subtlety works. If you're talking about this, you know, iconic doll and this iconic toy and everything, I don't think you can go subtle with Barbie. I, I've no. seen people who are not happy with that or wish that it had been deeper or whatever. And I can understand that, but I mean, it's still a Barbie movie. And I think like, I think that's what I appreciated about it was that it kind of melded those two in a way that was unique and interesting and accessible for lots of people. And I I don't know. I, I thought it worked personally. So I guess that's actually probably the perfect transition point into talking about Ken. Yes. Because he's a unexpectedly big part of this movie. For sure. You know, you see him on the poster alongside Barbie and you just thought, oh, it's Ken, you know, and it the movie kind of treats him like you know, for for the people who need a refresher on what his journey is. He goes from I think there's a line by Helen Mirren, like Ken's day relies up, upon Barbie being there or something like that mm -hmm. and being like obsessed with Barbie to have a good day and to oh hey what's this patriarchy thing and what what's or what do horses have to do with it to ultimately kind of a place of self-love by the end of it so yeah let's just talk about that how did you feel about where he went it what well, his journey in the movie i thought it was fantastic he so ryan gosling was just phenomenal he was so so good it was really impressive to watch him in every scene he was in I felt he like he was the scene stealer and yeah as much as this is Barbie's movie this is definitely Ken's movie I think he has a bigger like character arc even than Barbie I mean maybe it's close but I don't know I feel like she comes in pretty fully formed and her her journey is, yeah, not, I don't know. I think his might be better, quite honestly. But yeah, yeah. I, he was fantastic. I, yeah, there wasn't a part of it that I felt like they missed. I thought it was pitch perfect the whole way through. From, from him, like, wanting to impress her at the party and doing the little dance and everything. And then wanting to follow her into the real world and then realizing, oh, maybe if all these things, maybe if I'm in charge of everything, she'll actually love me more, you know, to, you know, the best scene in the, <laughs> in the movie with the like dream ballet to, yeah, like coming to this realization of, oh, hey, you know, I... I can be my own person. I just, yeah, it was just fantastic. So, so, so good. Yeah. And I think it uh, kind of worked hand in hand with, uh, you, you, you know, you said feminism 101, but I actually almost think it's something deeper than that. It's saying, hey, you can still be men. You can, here's feminism, but here's where you're wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. But not, but not even, but it doesn't go out of its way to try to make Ken like a bad guy. It just makes him misunderstood as in like, oh, I thought this was a good thing because people like me now. Right. And I thought that was like the crucial element of it is I think if you had a version of this movie without that subtlety of it, I think people wouldn't attach to it as much because it wouldn't make sense because, you know, the main, main thrust you have is his whole lens, his whole day, his whole existence is being seen through the lens of Barbie. And at, right before he get, we go to the real world, Barbie's like, no, you can't stay over my house. I'm going to host a dance party. And, with accent, like eccentric dance, like a full dance and things like that. I forget the exact quote, but but he in, leaves Barbie World, Barbie Land, end up dejected. He had been, just been rejected by the one person he admires the most. So it actually makes sense, I think, 
to when he goes to the real world and people like, hey, dude, what's up? And kind of, which I also think is kind of queer coded. But because I, yeah, I I feel like kids won't pick up on that. But I, I definitely picked up on like, oh, people like him because like the flamboyant dress, dressing and everything. They're like, oh, maybe he's, maybe Ken's gay, which I also enjoyed is that it wasn't just this template of the idyllic boyfriend. It was just, Ken can be many things, um, but he also needs to realize how to love himself, too. Right. He, need, he needs to realize he's knuff. Right. <laughs> Which I, I would have bought the hoodie if it wasn't 50 bucks. Right. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that that part was really well done, and probably my favorite part of the movie because I think I think without that part the more you get into uh, that third act because Ryan Gosling disappears for an entire act of this movie yeah basically and you're like oh where's Ryan and then when you then when you see Ryan you're like oh <laughs> this is the like three act structure finally realized and I think, yeah, I just, I, I echo your statements. I think it, I think he did a really good job. And I hope, I hope that's enough to put him on the supporting actor list. I, I haven't looked at the WBFYC site, which is up, by the way. I haven't looked at it yet, or at least not in detail. I have looked at it, just not in detail. With like the categories and everything. Mm -hmm. but I don't know if, I don't know if they have him in supporting actor yet. Off the list. I hope so. He's. Mm, yeah i mean it's one of my favorite performances of the year for sure so and i think you touched on something too that i think is really interesting and it's the idea of intent because i think a lot of times when you start talking about some of these big issues like feminism and patriarchy and all this stuff it can feel like oh, there's just a lot of like ill intent in it or I'm trying to do these things or whatever, allowing this to happen or whatever kind of ideas are happening. And I think a lot of times it's just, this is just the culture we grow up in. This is just kind of how it is. And so you have a tendency to just accept this is how this works. This is how this exists. I don't think Ken goes into the patriarchy and taking over Barbie land and making it Ken world or whatever it was. Kendom. Is that what it was? I don't remember. I think so. The Mojo the Dojo Kendom. Casa House, whatever. I mean, it's, he didn't go there necessarily with negative intentions. His goal was just to have Barbie notice him and love him as much as the other people out in this world that does have patriarchy. And he goes, oh, maybe patriarchy is the thing that will make her love me. And so I don't think he's doing it from this negative, I hate Barbie, I hate women, I hate the Barbie society kind of thing. I think it's just this is what looks like will work for me. This will get me to my end goal. And I think if I'm taking something from the movie, that would be one of the things that I would look at is, hey, how are some of the things that maybe we're ascribing negative intentions to, maybe that's just the way things are. And what we need to do is instead of like screaming patriarchy, screaming feminism, whatever kind of things, say this is how this hurts you this is how it hurts me how it hurts both men and women how it hurts everybody here and what's the way that we can get to these things without some of the you know look beyond some of these structures that we have i guess that would be the other thing for me is how can we do that better and i thought ken's journey in particular does that really well yeah, and it never really talks down and puts it simplistically like just a blanket statement of men bad or right. so something like that. And by the way, I don't have a problem with that, but it tends to lack nuance mm -hmm. when you just re reduce it down to like two words. So having something where it's like, oh, no, he just wants Barbie to notice her, him and mm -hmm. to say, 
hey, maybe I don't have the dance party tonight. And I think what's heartbreaking in the way his story ends up, at the very least, because I don't think they're doing a sequel to this movie, and I don't think you should. But at the end of the movie, he doesn't get, like, any semblance of... It's more of a message of, hey, work on yourself. I've got to go be who I need to be. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it just... It's kind of ends on a dour note for Ken. It's like, hey, you know that person you're trying to like have the object of your affection for the entire movie? Now she's going to go and like do her own thing. Right. Yeah. He does not get the girl at the end. (laughs) Which which is nice. Yeah. (laughs) It's depressing, but it's nice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I I thought that was kind I did think that was kind of interesting that at the end. And one of the things that I love about this movie and the marketing for it is that you go in and they talk about, you know, Barbie's everything. She's everything. He's just Ken. And and it's easy to look at that and look at it in terms of the context of, you know, the toys and whatever, because it's definitely Barbie. And then Ken is just an accessory. Like Ken doesn't do things like it's all barbies and then you might have one ken to your like as a girl who had barbies i had a bunch of barbies and i think we had one maybe two kens like i didn't have kens i mostly had barbie dolls and i think that is true of most people most people don't have a whole bunch of kens and a barbie you have mostly barbies and a ken and so it's easy to think oh barbie's everything he's just ken And that is part of it. But then at the end, I love how they kind of flip that to, especially when you get to Gloria America Ferreira's speech. And she's like, here are all the things you have to do to be a woman. And it's kind of that everything flipped negative and just Ken can almost be a positive. Like you can be Ken without barbie without somebody else to like validate you and i just thought that was really interesting because yeah you have one perspective going in but i think the movie flips those a little bit and i think that's just that that to me is some very nice writing yeah yeah and i think it yeah i just and i hope the screenplay gets uh noms at at the very least uh adapted or original it is so hard for me to imagine it's adapted, but I know I've seen it being talked about as that since Barbie's an existing IP, but. So let me check real quick. Yeah, because I'm curious because it feels like it should be <laughs> a, an original screenplay. I don't know. Yeah, okay, one second while I look this up. So they don't have it up yet. So that maybe that's why I'm not able to dig into it is I. It, all it says is thank you for visiting. Please check back soon for our upcoming slates of films for awards consideration. So that's all it says. Okay. Yeah, I, I will be very anxious to see where that one goes because it feels like it could. Uh, I, it, I've heard it floated for both, so I'll be very anxious to see where it ends up. So I think it's going to be adapted. Yeah. Because knives, uh, not knives out. Glass Onion was adapted. Mm, okay. So uh, just based off of that alone, and I think they're, what what was the, I forget what the argument was. I think it was because it was a sequel to Mm -hmm. The Knives Out. It it went under adapted or something. Uh, There there was like some technicality. Right. It was razor thin, but but that's how it was submitted because it was like you said based on something like based on knives out or something like that yeah and that's i think you're probably right i think it'll be because it's based on you know mattel's barbie or whatever even though it does not feel like it is so <laughs> it does not but that's okay um, it's fine <laughs> but, but that's actually a good segue uh to ruth handler um mm, yeah like the, like the avatar or whatever you want to call her of ruth handler the inventor of barbie Right. So how how did you feel? uh, How how did you feel about her, you know, in the movie? I liked her more or less. I thought she had some really beautiful moments. Like she had some of the heart moments. 
I guess, yeah, it's tough because one of my absolute favorite scene in the whole movie, like if I'm looking at the whole thing and picking a favorite moment, it's Barbie on the park bench and she's trying to like connect to whoever it is that's making her feel all the things that she's feeling uh, that's giving her her existential crisis. So and she's sitting there and she's just trying to like connect. And then there's this old woman to her right. And, you know, she turns to her, she says, you're so beautiful. And she says, I know. And it's just this like lovely moment of just seeing the humanity of everyone, particularly people we may not necessarily look at and find attractive or whatever. And I feel like the inclusion of Ruth maybe a little bit diluted that to some degree, because I think that's such a great, beautiful moment. I know that like Greta fought to keep that in the movie. I think the execs had said, no, we want to dump that. It's just too slow, which I could see. It is like a quiet moment in, in the middle of a pretty, you know, fun movie. And so there's a little part of me that says, maybe I feel like Ruth maybe dilutes that a little bit, but even so, I don't know. I still kind of like her as the creator, having her there. I just wish there had been some kind of way to like mesh those two better. I don't know. I, it just feels a little bit disjointed in that part. That's exactly what I was going to bring up. I was like, you know, maybe have a, a scene where, you know, gosh, I can't believe I'm bringing Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker <laughs> into this. So I guess spoilers for a movie that is now four years old, but there's a scene when, when Emperor Palpatine gets introduced and he's like, I've been every voice inside your head, you know, Snoke, Darth Vader. I think there was another voice. Anyways, I wish there was kind of like a moment like that where like the lady on the park bench transforms Animorph style, I guess, yeah. uh, into, <laughs> in, in, into uh, like Ruth Handler. That would have been a good way to connect it because otherwise, you know, Greta, you know, going back to uh, the bus scene. Mm hmm waiting for the bus and you know fighting to keep that she i believe her exact quote was i don't know what this movie is without that scene right and i yeah. feel like connecting ruth handler to that would have really cemented that and maybe have i don't know kind of put more connective tissue into it but yeah i i i don't feel like Ruth Handler was necessary. It felt like less of a Greta Gerwig thing and, and more of a, hey, uh, we're Mattel, and this is like the start of our big franchise. It's like film, uh, they have like a Hasbro Films thing going on mm -hmm. where they're trying to make uh, Rock'em Sock'em robots into a movie and stuff like that, which I, you know, there, there was a Rock'em Sock'em robots movie. It was, was called... There? It was called Real Steel. Oh, I have not seen that. <laughs> you should. It's a good bad movie. Oh, I love good bad movies. Yay. <laughs> it's got a uh, Hugh Jackman in it. It came out in 2011, I think. Right on. <laughs> One of my first advanced screenings back when, like, they would show things off and the VFX wasn't finished to the public. Hmm. But anyways, uh, yeah, I, I get going back to Ruth Handler. I, I just don't think she's super essential to this movie. I agree. I don't, other than the ending, mm -hmm. um, which, again, bringing up Fri Rise of Skywalker, <laughs> kind of <laughs> feels like the moment where when, where Barbie says her name's Barbara Handler. It kind of rang to me of the thing of what's your name ray yeah, ray what's your last name skywalker. skywalker and it's like it's like well no your actual name's ray palpatine but okay right. sure <laughs> it was just like one of those weird moments where you know we're wrapping up and it's just it, it, it didn't feel honest mm -hmm. anyways no nah, i'd my, agree with that i'll uh take my film bro hat off and <laughs> and put my regular person film film hat on but going back a little bit because i think the psychology it and sociology of this movie is a big factor in why i liked it 
there's themes of existentialism, individualism. Let's see. Let's tackle existentialism, the big one first. <laughs> big one, yeah. <laughs> so Barbie has worries of dying. You know, she she's at a dance party and she's like, do you guys ever feel it? think about dying? <laughs> and then, you know, she somebody mentions like you'll get fat and you'll get like this thing called cellulite and things like that. Right. Which I think ties a little bit more into its, you know, feminism one of one theme. But what did you what did you think about how that was handled? You know, you know, what did you think? I thought it was kind of interesting, especially when you get to the part where it's not Sasha who's, you know, playing with Barbie, but it's Gloria. So Mm -hmm. I think that works because I think there are plenty of women who, yeah, have these like concerns about, oh, I mean, I went and let my hair go naturally gray you know a few years ago and there is this thing of like oh i don't know that automatically makes me look older maybe i should keep dyeing my hair and so like i can kind of see that because like yeah if you have gray hair well you're seen as older therefore you're seen as more expendable so if you have cellulite if you're too fat whatever then that might make you less desirable for a promotion or some kind of job thing or you know with a partner or whatever. And so like, I didn't really, I thought that that was interesting, you know, the way that they did that. Yeah, I mean, I thought it worked. And especially if you're talking about like stereotypical Barbie, who's the Barbie you think of, if you say Barbie doll, I think that works uh, for the most part. I mean, again, it's like not super nuanced, but eh, I could get with it. (laughs) I thought it worked. Yeah, I, I think it works pretty well and, and is kind of humorous in its own way yeah. where I, I forget what Barbie says it and she just like screams flat feet. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ari Neff is so fantastic in that moment. I love it. That's who it was. <laughs> and gosh, somebody made a joke about that scene. They're like, did Quentin Tarantino direct <laughs> the, these scenes? Yeah. What but, I did... Uh, Oh, no, what I was going to say with regard to the flat feet thing, what I loved about that was when she went and she's walking up to uh, Weird Barbies and she has the heels on again. And she's like, oh, I would never wear these if I didn't, you know, (laughs) if my feet didn't already do that. This is so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I thought, yes, exactly. (laughs) If I never wear a pair of heels again in my life, that's fine. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I I think it it tries to deal with very serious issues in a humorous way where it's like, yeah, she's she's joking about dying and getting so like those are her concerns, not like, can I survive? Can I do I make enough money? Just oh, am I gonna die? Right. But you know, you're talking, and we'll get to Gloria really soon. I promise, because I do think she's another big part of this movie. But really quick, I wanted to talk talk about individualism because that's a big, big part of this movie. Specifically, and this is something we talked about in our main podcast episode. And if you haven't checked that out, what are you doing? Check that out first and then oh. come back. Yeah. Come on. We I even <laughs> made like I even like colored the background to be Barbie pink. Come on. Yeah. I catch which, it. Which uh, I which I did not know was an actual color that is actually named Barbie Pink. Right. <laughs> so it's that exact hex color for those design nerds out there. Anyways, another thing we talked about in the main podcast episode was Alan, you know, just kind of being uninterested in what Ken was up to, what the other Kens were up to. And I think it really gets into the individualism of who the idea of Alan, Ken, and Barbie as their own individual people. So how did that work for you in respect? to the overall themes of the movie and just in general yeah I thought it was really really good the way that they did that because there is there's there's something interesting because at the beginning everybody I mean and they openly talk about it you know we talk about weird Barbie you know behind her back and to her face you know (laughs) 
<laughs> like yeah. we call her weird Barbie, you know, behind her back, but also to her face. And I thought that was funny, but there is like Midge is over here. Alan is over here. And the only people that matter are the Kens and the Barbies, you know, the people who are at least alike enough to all be Kens and all be Barbies. And as it goes, you have these characters and, you know, by the end of the movie, we're seeing them integrated in. It's like, oh, weird Barbie, you get to come live with us. You get to be part of this. I'm sorry we called you weird, whatever. And there's this thing of like, yeah, our collective identity as Barbies, as Kens, becomes less necessary because it really can't be that and like we have to it, it's interesting yeah in this like collectivism kind of idea of having people coming together as a community but we need everybody to bring their individual selves to it and so I thought it was kind of neat because sometimes you get into individualism and it's I'm just gonna go do my own thing and I don't really care about anybody but this is like we need you to be your individual self and bring that to the group. And I thought that was done really well. Yeah. And I think, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking about the good place, maybe because it deals with some of that a lot, mm -hmm. which go watch the good place. It's probably on Peacock or something like that. It, it, but the way this handled it was very well done and not such a selfish way that, you know, good place was like, what if you just, completely acted for yourself and this was more of like hey who is alan who mm -hmm. is ken who is barbie and why are they named different why is this stereotypical barbie why is this a uh, nobel prize bar barbie what, what are the other ones like president barbie something like that and i think it really drills down into and i, I i'm i'm of the same of cord i think it does really tie very well into that theme of Yes, we are individuals, but how can we bring that to our community? How mm -hmm. can we bring our individual selves to our community to stop kingdom or kin land? I forget what it is, yeah. and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not paying the uh, twenty five bucks to find find out. <laughs> maybe maybe one day. Maybe, right. Subscribe to my Patreon. With that said, let's talk about the elephant. Well, that sounds weird. But she, Lori is not the elephant in the room. I don't think so. She's just like one of the biggest characters. She's yeah. like outside of Ken and Barbie. She is one of the biggest characters. And, you know, we've mentioned uh, the relationship between a mother and her daughter and kind of generational, how we grow up and things like that. Let's just talk about Gloria a little bit. What did you have to say that you couldn't say on the main podcast about Gloria? I mean, probably not a whole lot, because honestly, I think she's, I mean, I think she, her speech is like the pivotal moment, I think, in so much of the, of the movie and the discourse around the movie, outside yeah. of, you know, ranting about stuff when you didn't see the movie, or didn't pay attention to the movie when you saw it. Okay. But yeah, I, I thought that she was really an interesting character. I like how they brought this you know, real person who has some Barbie-ish kind of characteristics, I guess. But she's a person of color. She is, you know, not young, <laughs> at least, you know, old enough to have a teenage daughter. And so I thought they did, I thought she was an interesting person to play kind of like, I guess, opposite Barbie in that regard. Like America Ferreira, the... Yeah. As the, as the actor. And I think they used her well. To me, the biggest frustration in this is I wish there had been more time between her and her daughter, between Gloria and Sasha. I felt like that just felt to me like the thinnest part. If you're going to talk about mothers and daughters, and I think that the movie does that between Ruth and Barbara, you know, uh, you know, creator and her daughter who she named the doll after. And you have like those kind of themes. I wish there had been just more time spent understanding the dynamic between Gloria and Sasha because it just felt very glossed over to me. I didn't feel like we had a whole lot of background other than here's the sulky teen, 
here's her mom who's kind of going through some stuff like midlife crisis y kind of thoughts. And like, I don't know, I, I it just didn't feel like that was fleshed out in a way that I would have liked to have seen it before we got into the third act. I feel like too much of the second act was spent at Mattel and I wish that had been nixed in favor of giving us more Gloria and Sasha. Yeah, so you know how you fix that? And it's really easy. And this also fixes a problem I have with Ruth Handler. Part in it. So th- this is about the creator and her daughter at one point. It, it would be very easy to fit a scene where Ruth hands Barbie to her daughter for the first time and sees her play with it and sees how much Barbie means. Or even even like interstitial between ep- not episodes. I'm thinking about Ahsoka. Star Wars on my mind, apparently. Still, apparently, yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently. But in between Acts 1 and 2, where we start going to Mattel and go to the real world. And I do want to say, in regards to Gloria, I think there was almost a Toy Story-like quality to it. To mm-hmm. the way the way it was revealed that Gloria played with Barbie, and that's how Barbie got sad. Not not to remind anyone of some emotional trauma, but there's a very similar scene in Toy Story 2. I'm not I'm not gonna go any further because that scene mm, I can't go I can't make it through that scene. I still can't. Uh, oh. uh, mm. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, Jesse's story is heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, just hearing exactly. the music in my head and yeah. I'm like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Me too. I'm like yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna try and fight through this. When when Gloria finds Barbie, it's that that very same note of here's the life I live now, and what what is, does it mean? What what are all those years worth? What what happens now? And yeah, I, I don't know. I I just felt like it had a really nice quality to it. That said. I would have liked, as you said, some more time with Gloria and her daughter. Oh, gosh. I forget her name. Sasha. Asha. So, um, yeah, Sasha. Yeah. Sasha. Gloria yeah. and Sasha. Maybe even like a hint towards like, hey, Glo- like maybe Gloria looks at the doll and then we cut to like Barbie having those feelings. Right. Yeah. I mean, I thought they... I thought it was like done well enough that you can see this frustration with Sasha as she's, you know, they show it in the first scene, I think when she's talking to weird Barbie and she, it cuts mostly to like focus on Sasha. And then the second time when she's in the real world, it zooms back and you see, Oh no, the actual person is Gloria that we're supposed to be focusing on. That's who's, you know, kind of transferring her, feelings on there but i think there is especially when they have the quote at the end ruth says something along the lines of you know mother stands still so they can see how far their daughters go or something like that and as somebody who has adult children it's there is something that can be kind of like difficult because you have these people who are your little kids and then you do whatever with them for all this time and then there's this odd time where you're trying to figure out how to be a parent to this person who is an adult themselves and trying to like sort through that. And it's messy, especially, you know, if you, with my oldest, it was hard because there's just, it's a weird way to kind of get through that. And I think that's what the movie's trying to do. I just don't feel like it's super clear in the way that it does that. I wish it, I wish it had just been a little bit, I don't know, but I just wish more time. I just wish everything with Will Ferrell wasn't in the movie. That's all. It's not that those parts are bad. They're just, I think they take away from what the, like what the movie wanted to do. I mean, I know they had to do it to whatever with Mattel probably, but. eh. I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I, I think you can cut that Mattel stuff out of the movie and it makes no difference. No, I agree. There's no, there's no, it adds nothing to the movie. Yeah. Because, I mean, 
I'm trying to remember, but I think Will Ferrell and the Mattel crew, and I'm just going to call him Will Ferrell because he has a very forgettable name. In, yeah, I don't even know what his character's name is. <laughs> like, I might, might as well call him Lord Business because it's the same <laughs> character from Lego movie. But yeah, I think he arrives in Barbie land and then he's just chill. And he's like, oh, she just came back by herself. Okay, I'm going to yeah. leave now. Like, yeah. oh, okay, then... Again, I think it's one of those things where, and maybe you meant this when you were saying, like, that's a Mattel thing. I, I also think this ties into the Ruth Handler thing of just not really fitting with the movie. Right. At least in its current state. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some fan film comes out that has a longer cut of it, or maybe there's a four-hour cut lying out there in the WB servers. Right. <laughs> I, I, I really don't. I probably should be careful with saying that because the last time I, the, a, a four hour cut was on WB servers, it had a whole thing. Right. It was a whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do you, yeah, I, I, that's all I've got really on Barbie mm -hmm. as far as spoilers go, go. What do you, what do you, do you want to bring up anything else that I maybe missed? Yeah. The only one thing I love. At the end, and I wrote this quote down when I went to see it. I was looking through my notes on my phone, and this quote like grabbed me when I was watching the movie. And Sasha's talking to the Barbies, and she, I think they, they don't, they're just ready to leave. I think Gloria's just ready to head out. And Sasha says, even if you can't make it perfect, you can make it better. And I just really, I thought that was such a beautiful line. I'm just a sucker for a good line. And there are so many that like are said through the movie, but that one, is, like that's not one that I've seen out memed a whole lot, but I just really love that. And I think that to me is what the movie's about is no, we can't, you know, Barbie's never going back to stereotypical Barbie. She doesn't, that's not her journey is back to, you know, this place. Barbie land is changed after, you know, the Mojo Dojo Casa house. Like it's not the same anymore. Like it's similar, but it's not the same. And like the perfection that they thought it was can't really, it doesn't really exist. And it wasn't really perfect to begin with, but now it's better. It's not perfect. It's better. And I just think to me, if I had to boil the whole movie down to one line, that's it. We can't make it perfect, but we can make it better. Yeah, and that actually brings up two things. Well, actually one thing. But I was thinking while you were talking about this, I was talking about editing earlier, and I have a message to all you TikTokers out there. Please. And to the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. First, I'll go with the TikTokers. Please, please, I don't want to see another Billie Eilish edit of some random thing you're doing. I don't want to see another, like, sad, no. And to the Academy, please, if it gets nominated, if that specific song gets nominated, do not vote for it. I That that is so similar for to her other song, No Time to Die. For me, at least. And then the other thing is, I don't know if you're watching, the reason I was doing like this is for whatever reason, when you were saying that quote, the wicked song for good started playing in my head. I'm oh. like, who can know if I've been changed for the better? Right. Maybe because I've been thinking about high school musicals, the musical, the series, and they sing that at the end of the series. Okay. Like at the very end. But who knows if they, if Barbie Land has been changed for good? I think so. But because I knew Ken. But anyways, <laughs> jokes aside, I really love this movie. It's one of my very few five stars, and I am also a sucker for a good line. Like, what's that like? We we're talking about this line a lot, and it's been online a lot. The speech of Gloria and the bus scene. Those are the two standout moments where if that is not an Oscar clip for that's a crime. Yeah. Because you could use the bus scene for best screenplay. Mm -hmm. And then the speech for maybe America. Well, I don't know about America. I don't know if she's getting. Yeah. 
I mean, it was we'll a good see. line. Maybe, maybe you yeah. could use either for a screenplay. Uh, you could use either for a screenplay. Yeah. Um, but with that said, uh, I think that about does it for the yeah. spoiler-filled uh, discussion. Oh, I think we have to say b- bye to Barbie Land, uh, at least until uh, eventually, I'm sure. I'm absolutely certain of this d- during David Zaslav's reign at Warner Brothers Discovery. I am sure we will get a Barbie sequel, whether we want it or not. Probably I'll not be here to lament my- with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Come on. Come on in about four years yeah. and then we'll talk about that. But with that said, thank you everyone for listening to the Austin B media podcast. I have been your host, Austin Belzer. I, you know, I don't know why I do this when I say I'm your host, but there you go. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe wherever possible, whether it's Spotify, whatever podcast platform you have, or, you know, I've got an RSS feed on the website. And then leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. You can follow me on social media at Austin B Media everywhere except for X. Let's see. What are the social networks I'm on? Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook. Don't follow me on LinkedIn. If you send me a LinkedIn request, I'll deny it. Mastodon, Pebble is now the new name of T2. Reds and then X. So everywhere but X or Twitter or whatever we want to call it, I'm at Austin B Media. And I have Blue Sky, Blue Sky invite codes. I've got five invite codes. So, but I'm most active on threads. So follow me there if you really want to get real time updates. But at least where people can, where, let me try that again. Elise, where can people find you? I am not on X at all, but you can find me as Elise Chapins. Most places on TikTok, I'm Elise D. Chaffins, but I think everywhere else I'm Elise Chaffins. Yeah, my Substack, that's probably the best place to find me. And that is elisechaffins.substack.com, or you can search for MacGuffin or Meaning. So, yeah. And hopefully soon we will have a new podcast coming out, Best Worst Movies. I am talking with some folks in the next few days. So, yeah, look for that, but not quite yet. I know my movie. Oh, yay. <laughs> Real Steel. I can come on and talk oh, about that. There we go. Well, that's it. <laughs> Perfect. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me.